is Rebecca Cabaretti. And my name is Jin Lin Lane. And we are students in the graduate program for counseling at the University of Central Oklahoma. And this video today is designed to be an educational tool for people who are interested in treat the treatment for tics and Tourette syndrome, or for people who are just interested in better managing their disorder. Okay. Um, the video is going to cover um, what is tics and Tourette, what causes tics, um, and an evidence-based treatment named Comprehensive Behavior Intervention for Tics. What are tics? Tics are sudden, rapid, recurrent, non-rhythmic motor movements or vocalizations. Tourette syndrome typically begins with eye blinking and facial movement. Motor tics usually come before vocal tics. Simple tics usually come before complex tics. Based on the DSM-5, tic disorders are comprised of four diagnostic categories. Tourette's disorder, persistent or chronic motor or vocal tic disorder, provisional tic disorder, and the other specified and unspecified tic disorders. So what are the differences between the four diagnostic criteria for tic disorder? For Tourette's disorder, both motor and vocal tics must be present, whereas for persistent, chronic, motor, or vocal tic disorder, only motor or only vocal tics are present. For provisional tic disorder, motor and or vocal tics may be present. For other specified or unspecified tic disorders, the movement disorder symptoms are best characterized as tics but are atypical in presentation or age at onset or have a known etiology. The one-year minimum duration criterion is a must for individuals diagnosed with either Tourette's disorder or persistent motor or vocal tic. Tics wax and wane in severity and some individuals may have tic-free periods from weeks to months, but as long as their first tic onset is more than a year, regardless of their tic-free period, they are considered to have persistent symptoms. For an individual with motor and or vocal tics of less than one year since first tic onset, he or she is qualified for provisional tic disorder. There is no duration specification for other specified and unspecified tic disorders. For Tourette's persistent and provisional tic disorders, the onset of tics must occur before age 18 years. The tic disorder are hierarchy in order. For example, Tourette's disorder, followed by persistent chronic motor or vocal tic disorder, followed by provision tic disorder, followed by specific and unspecific tic disorder, such that once a tic disorder at one level of the hierarchy is diagnosed, a lower hierarchy diagnosis cannot be made. So tell us, what causes tics and Tourette's exactly? Um, well, genetic have uh, play an important role in tics and Tourette's. Um, genetic studies have indicated that um, Tourette's is inherited as a dominant gene. Um, family members with Tourette's are 150 times more likely to have tics than the general population. Um, so a person with Tourette's has roughly a 50% chance of passing the genes to their children. And then, but this doesn't mean that the children will inherit um, an identical form of Tourette's. Um, their condition may be milder or more severe. Um, and they may display different types of tics too. Um, so far, there is no single genes have been convincingly identified. Um, so exactly how Tourette is inherited, um, it's not clear. Um, but it appears that it appears to involve an imbalance in the function of the neuron transmitter, which are the dopamine and serotonin. Um, brain scanning has revealed that um, there are some areas of the brain that appear to be different in individuals with Tourette's. Um, so, for example, some structural in the basal ganglia part of the brain and in the frontal temporal brain area. area. So, 
how do they how do these exactly affect Tourette's? Okay, think of Tourette's as something like this. Um, you have this genetic predisposition that leads to certain part of your brain that form not quite correctly. Um, this part of the brain that gets the most attention is the CSTC pathway. Um, these are the loops in the brain that controls different aspects of behavior. Um, the S, which is the strider, decide which movement is appropriate to a given situation. Um, so imagine this, um, up on your uh, motor cortex of your brain, store all your movement signal. So um, whenever you want to move, the cell, the neuron gets activated. Um, and then the neuron sends signal down into the basal ganglia or the strider and then send down the little pieces of movement. Um, they are not full movement, they are bits of movement, parts of movement, um, or parts of sounds, if you will. Um, and these bits and pieces all get sent down. And uh, all the possible movement we get to do at a given time. Okay, so now some of these signals are stopped because they are not appropriate for the given situations. Um, some of those signals are appropriate for that situation gets let through. Uh, and then they get connected to the hypothalamus and they perform the behavior and we perform the behavior of the movement. Um, so takes is a bit of that movement that gets slipped through when it shouldn't. Okay, so the strider or the brain. Um, how do we know what movement or behavior it's allowed through when it is appropriate for situations? Or whether it is appropriate for situations. Um, how do we sh how do we know that strider um, block the signal or let the signal come in through? Okay, well, the basal ganglia or the strider um, gets lots of feedback from other area of the brain, and they are sensitive to reinforcement. Um, so the sensitivity to the environment. Um, change right after behavior that tells the brain hey whatever you just did there do it again that feels good um, so for example if I have an itch on my body um, I could do a lot of things um, by keeping my hands down I can scratch it um, looking to the side okay um, all these signals are coming down from my brain and my brain says, hey, last time you feel all the stuff and you scratch and it felt good. So do that again. Okay, that's the signal that gets allowed through. And the rest of them get blocked like the hand, the head turning, all that kind of stuff. So the brain, the strider, is sort of like a gatekeeper and the feedbacks from the environment. So whether the strider let a signal go through or stop, depending on the history of the situations. Okay, so what exactly a tick is? A tick is one of the little movement that gets through and then how the environment reacts to it, it's going to make a big difference to whether it continue to go through again and again and again. Okay, so this is how the genetics and the environment affect ticks. What you're saying then is that ticks are actually neurological deficits. Mm -hmm. So why would we use then a behavioral therapy to treat a neurological condition? Okay, um, think about stroke. Okay. Mm -hmm. Stroke is a neurological problem, and after a stroke, will you do nothing to recover? Mm -hmm. I mean, no. Um, you will try to recover, and they are physical therapy, occupational therapy, and both of them are actually various forms of behavior therapy. So you learn a new skill, um, practice a behavior over and over, over and over again, um, basically. You just learn to overcome a neurological deficit. Um, 
this isn't any different than ticks. Mm -hmm. So behavior therapy somehow can change mm -hmm. the brain. So what is Comprehensive Behavioral Intervention for Ticks, or CBIT, exactly? Well, it's a non-medication treatment that consists of three important components. These involve, one, training the patient to be more aware of their ticks, training patients to do a competing behavior when they feel the urge to tick, and three, making changes to daily activities in a way that can be helpful for reducing those ticks. CBIT is a combination of several elements. First, psychoeducation for both the patient and the parent is conducted. This is done to eliminate potentially negative social consequences of having tics by eliminating those social reactions that actually reinforce tics. The internal antecedent conditions like worry or anxiety may diminish and potentially eliminate the tic exacerbating factors. Next, Relaxation training is also used to reduce the stress that a person with tick disorder experience. Um, this is included in therapy because of the ideas that having stress makes a person less able to control their ticks as well. Um, the most common relaxation training involves um, deep, deep breathing combined with progressively tensing and relaxing the muscles groups in your body. The function-based intervention is a two-stage process. The first is the function-based assessment, and the second is the selection of the function-based intervention, which is based on results of the assessment. The functional assessment interview is for the particular tick that is being addressed in the session and should involve the child, the parent, and the therapist discussing all the events that surround the tick, providing as much detail as possible. The child and the parent will be given a functional assessment self-report form that will be used as homework throughout the following week. Anytime a tick occurs, they should observe and record the factors and situations that make the ticks worse. Once the antecedents and consequences have been explored, and based on all the data gathered between the assessment interview and the self report information, the therapist, patient, and parents will develop a function-based intervention that is specific to the antecedents and the consequences of the patient. After developing a function-based intervention with the patient and the family, develop a concrete plan that everyone has agreed on and have them record it. Write it down on the function-based intervention form. Habit reversal training is the other important component of CBIT otherwise known as HRT. This portion of the treatment consists of the following procedures. Awareness training, which the purpose is to make the patient aware, aware of when the tick is happening or about to happen. Competing response training, which the purpose is to teach the patient to engage in behaviors that are incompatible with the tick. And social support, which the purpose is to find a person who can reinforce and prompt the patient to use the competing response. Basically, which, what HRT is designed to do is to disrupt a habitual motor pattern after it has started. It creates habituation to the premonitory urge, and we're going to look at each of these three procedures a little bit more. Habit reversal training consists of four steps. One, introducing awareness. 2. Describing the ticks. 3. Describing the antecedent sensations and behaviors. And 4. Acknowledging antecedent sensations and the occurrence of ticks. Step 1 is awareness training. This is done to teach the patient to acknowledge each tick verbally when they happen or are about to happen. This is so important that you should not proceed with the competing response training or the social support until this has been firmly established. The reason this is so important is because if the patient is unaware of the tick or urges, the procedure just won't be effective. It's also very important to provide a rationale before starting awareness training. It might look something like this little script.
Step two of HRT awareness training is describing the tick. It should be described in so much detail and done for each and every tick separately. Step three of HRT training is describing the antecedent sensations and behaviors. The purpose is for the patient to recognize the behaviors or private experiences that lead up to the actual tick they are having. Sensations and behaviors should be called warning signals or tick signals. Examples of these private experiences might be like an uncomfortable, vague itching sensation or a tightness or tension. Step four of HRT awareness training is acknowledging self-ticks. And this part is where the patient actually points out to the therapist when they notice them happening. Sometimes this can be really difficult or new and they may need to work on noticing the ticks. It can be helpful to stimulate the ticks in the session in some cases so there's an opportunity for them to practice. It's important to give feedback and praise when they do recognize the tick and then to give feedback and repeat the instructions when they don't recognize them. Sometimes it may be necessary for the therapist to actually perform the tick and have the child point it out or even to have them watch themselves on video. Competing response training is the second part of HRT. This part consists of three phases. The first is selecting a competing response that the patient can use when the urge to perform the tick begins. A competing response is a specific behavior that is selected because it is incompatible with the tick. The person cannot be able to tick while doing the behavior and they should be able to maintain this behavior for at least one minute. It should also be socially inconspicuous or at least less so than the tick itself. The goal should be something compatible with normal activities and should be selected in collaboration with the patient. The second phase is demonstrating the competing response or teaching the patient the correct way to perform the competing response. Do this until you are comfortable that the patient is doing the competing response correctly. The third phase is practicing the competing response in the correct way and practicing using it when the tick occurs at the appropriate times. The final part is to present the behavioral rewards program. This is designed to motivate the patient to attend sessions, to participate in session activities, to complete homework assignments, and just to increase the child's compliance with therapy in general. So this is basically a brief review of CBIT for ticks and Tourette's. We hope it has been informative and helpful. Thank you so much for watching.